This year, we are honored to have Marcina Rostek as a speaker. Uh, Marcina is the Julie Plant Granger Distinguished Chair of Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's also the co-editor of the American Economic Review, an associate editor of Econometrica, Economic Theory, and Economic Theory Bulletin, and, um, and was the editor of the Journal of Economic Theory until this year. In addition, she became a fellow of the Econometric Society in 2022 and of the Society for the Advancement of Economic Theory in 2020. Marcina obtained her PhD at Yale University. After graduation, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at Oxford University. Then she joined the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she has received many awards and prizes for her research and teaching. Marcina's interest research uh, focuses on financial markets, decentralized uh, market design, which is the topic of, um, of her lecture today. Equilibrium, stability, interactions among groups and games in contracts, theory and design of imperfectly competitive centralized markets, optimization and games and spans with applications to financial innovation, information disclosure and bonding, and qualitative decision making. Let's welcome my senior host. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, uh, please the questions at the end. Okay. Um. Thank you so much for having me. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, I'd like to use this opportunity to discuss uh, financial market design through several projects I've worked on and provide a bit of an overview of some of the current research in market design more broadly. So in lieu of the motivation, let's talk about the relevant literature. Um, why is this area of research so active right now? And what is the scope for contributing new results and new methods? Arguably, one of the salient developments in applied theory in recent years uh, has been all the work on financial market design motivated by uh, new data and new questions um, concerning market fragmentation and imperfect competition. We, we, we've seen parallel developments for other industries. Data on market uh, concentration and spatial data on market fragmentation continues to be reported for virtually every sector of the economy, production and labor markets international trade, monetary policy, and other industries which have traditionally been analyzed using competitive models of markets which are uh, centralized in some sense. For financial markets, we've known a key since the 1980s, that's when individual tree-level data became available, that the presence of large institutional investors is significant in the industry, um, in terms of trading volume as well as the ability to innovate and access data. Um, institutional investors routinely estimate their price impact. Uh, the trading costs associated with price impact continue to dominate all of the explicit trading costs, including commission fees, order processing fees, and brokerage fees. If anything, these explicit trading costs have diminished. Uh, we've known about price impact in financial markets for a while now. Meanwhile, uh, new data, uh, particularly the data that came out of the financial crisis, um, has highlighted the extent to which trading is fragmented or decentralized. Essentially, all financial assets are traded in a variety of coexisting uh, trading venues of various kinds, often um, for the same traders and assets. And we need to look no further than markets for stocks and bonds. This is just one example. Uh, the US equities are traded in 16 public exchanges, where public refers to the fact that all traders can participate there. Around 50 dark pools, these are private exchanges with participation restricted mostly to large institutional investors, and dozens of other uh, ATSs, alternative trading systems, um, and broker dealer networks. To be sure, uh, the availability of different trading arrangements to different types of traders is, is not novel. Goldman Sachs has always had a trading desk for large institutional investors. We used to call these markets and upstairs markets. Right, so in this talk, I will slightly conflate uh, market fragmentation with market power. Um, this is because uh, in a fragmented market, locally in the relationships in which traders participate uh, in an exchange or with a dealer, they're not negligible, they are large. So naturally, the fact that market fragmentation and um, imperfect competition are receiving renewed attention in the literature around the same time, and it's not quite coincidental. And there's a lot of interest in understanding 
and their drone effects. Tools for modeling strategic behavior and market fragmentation are not quite fully integrated just yet. But we do recognize that the assumption that trading is centralized, which is a single market clearing, applies to all traders and all assets, might be an accurate description of an auction, but not a market, not for most industries. Um, we also recognize that even though most markets have large numbers of participants, um, most of the economic activity is in the hands of a relatively small group of large players. So one might ask, what's the nature of the effort here? The effort towards building more realistic models of fragmented markets with traders who recognize their pricing and their market power. Is it primarily computational? We know that incorporating strategic behavior, uh, allowing for private information, or even trade heterogeneity is hard enough in centralized market models, especially if we care about the dynamics. Um, with fragmentation, all these challenges fill up. But perhaps with uh, some advanced algebra, we can get the results we need. Well, in this talk, I would like to underscore a couple of points. Decentralized market design has challenged the methods we rely on. In the sense, it will be a different kind of theory than the theory of centralized market design. Um, and also, how much has already been done? So let's take a look. Um, where does the equilibrium theory of imperfectly competitive uh, fragmented financial markets stand? Well, research on strategic behavior per se has a long tradition in financial markets. Uh, um, the literature on various problems concerning private information and insider trading has advanced through partial equilibrium models. However, until quite recently, the equilibrium of the market as a whole, as in pricing, have been studied and continue to be taught using competitive models of centralized trading with uh, semantic information, as possibly with uncertainty, but no uh, private information. Uh, likewise, the literature on decentralized trading is very active right now, to say the least. But it's useful to keep in mind that the effort to build rich, flexible models of decentralized financial markets really took off only in the mid-2000s. Since then, two classes of models have emerged, which, mathematically speaking, are based on graphs, random or fixed. Um, in an attempt to summarize where the literature is today, uh, two points are notable. So as we are transitioning towards working with and, and teaching optimization methods to various models of fragmented markets, there is an economical model of a decentralized trading just yet. It is unclear there should be one. And given what the data is telling us about the richness of market structures and market designs out there, it is, it is unclear it would be productive to have a model that would rival the generality of the competitive model we used to work with. Um, still, there is some room for integrating the tools from uh, random matching models and, and network models. Um, and second, um, since this literature took off in the mid-2000s, the focus in terms of questions has changed. And the change in the focus has really motivated the study of decentralized market design. So we call that the first generation of models that became popular when some of the pressing questions about market fragmentation came to light um, was uh, based, as dictated by tractability, on markets with a continuum of traders who are small relative to the interaction, and often a particular market structure, one asset, and semantic information. It has also the view of market fragmentation as a friction that takes away from efficiency in, in the early literature. Um, now these views have evolved, and indeed one of the contributions of the literature has been to qualify the presumption that the centralized market is always beneficial. So we now understand that uh, a fragmented market can be more efficient. It can help us improve the distribution of risk in some sense simplify the design for market participants and be more stable. Now, I listed some of the arguments that are available, but I should be careful uh, about how I summarize the takeaways from this literature. Um, as a matter of theory, the observation that a fragmented market can be more efficient when traders are large should not be surprising. The key question is, and has always been, 
Can we provide any general results that could guide the design and perhaps more ambitiously regulation? We have a beautiful theory of centralized market design. Auction design is part of it. Developing the corresponding design principles for fragmented markets is very much work in progress. These are some of the questions that um, keep me up at night. Um, the path isn't exactly straightforward. And as I see it, part of the reason is that decentralized trading has challenged the methods we've used. So this is the point I would like to elaborate on in the rest of this presentation, for examples in three different domains. For the first context, we will consider uh, welfare effects of market fragmentation. Um, we will work with uh, a textbook model, um, which has been around for a while, and in recent years has de developed into a pretty flexible framework for thinking about market fragmentation and market design with large players. So this is a model based on the uniform price double auction in which traders submit price contingent demand and supply schedules. And traders have multi-unit valuations, which allows for an explicit treatment of price impact. So the key advantage of this model is that it's a finite market and theoretic counterpart of the uh, competitive model, which is also based on a uniform price and multi-unit valuations. You can see a lot is happening in this literature right now. Still, most of what we understand about equilibrium with large players analytically has been established in a very different quadratic Gaussian setting. So all players' objectives are quadratic or equivalent. All random variables are jointly normally distributed, which I'll also assume you'll see that this is not essential for the types of conclusions I'll emphasize. Um, a useful perspective might be that even competitive models with heterogeneous traders are typically analyzed using numerical methods, often highly computational methods, and often rely on a quadratic approximation. With an additional fixed point due to strategic behavior and private information, we shouldn't really expect to rely on fully analytic solutions going forward. All right, so briefly, uh, the description of preferences in the assets is standard. A finite number of traders uh, trade multiple divisible risky assets with jointly normally distributed payoffs and the covariance matrix sigma. Um, traders write utility from their post trade allocation, which is the sum of the initial units we hold at QI0 and trade QI, these are vectors. There is private information in the market. I know how many units I hold, I do not know the positions of others. Right, so in this completely standard quadratic Gaussian setting, we will want to compare centralized and decentralized market designs. Let's make precise what these terms mean. So let, let's think for a moment. What do we assume when we take an off-the-shelf model of centralized trading? Well, the essence of centralized trading in a standard model is not um, centralized or decentralized implementation in the mechanics design sense or the social choice sense, but rather, that a single market clearing applies to all traders and all assets. In particular, two assumptions are implicit in the centralized market assumption. One is that trader participation in the market is complete in the following sense. Each trader trades all assets with all other investors. So naturally, this assumption has been relaxed by the large literature on decentralized trading based on random graphs, fixed graphs, and other models with limited participation, which weren't explicitly motivated by market fragmentation, but should get some credit here. Now, there is at least one other assumption implicit in the centralized market assumption. Um, when trading is decentralized, um, we need to be explicit, we as analysts need to be explicit, or a market design needs to be explicit, or a trading protocol needs to be explicit about the types of demands that was allowed. So imagine that I'm participating in a market with two exchanges, each for one asset, let's say the same asset. Should the demand I'm submitting in one exchange allow me to condition on the price from the other exchange as well? In other words, should I be submitting a fully contingent schedule, R2 to R2, with the quantity of each asset being a function of the price vector, or I should be submitting two uncontingent schedules, R to R, 
with the quality of each asset being a function of the price of that asset alone. The standard equilibrium model uh, on which asset pricing is based, competitive or imperfectly competitive, assumes that schedules are fully contingent. We work with the amounts that are created to our pay when we study multi-asset markets. Now, in practice, these fully contingent schedules represent cross-asset conditioning possibilities that exist in some, not too many trading protocols. More typically, an order place for an asset cannot be made contingent on prices of other assets. Um, if allowed, such cross-asset conditioning applies only to a limited number of assets. Right. We do, in fact, see cross-asset conditioning in markets for spectrum, electricity, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, certain options in futures markets. A combination of rules called the reg NMS and unlisted trading privileges um, implemented in U.S. equity markets um, about two decades ago de facto induces contingent schedules across the 16 public exchanges in the U.S. But we do not see analogous rules for markets with other asset classes. Why should we care? Okay, so let's take a closer look at how cross-asset conditioning matters. The assumption that schedules are fully contingent requires that the demands and supplies of all traders for all assets must be aggregated jointly to even determine the vector of market clearing prices and trades. The assumption of fully contingent schedules implies that all assets must clear jointly in financial markets for all traders. So part of what makes decentralized trading different is that uh, assets clear independently rather than jointly. And this difference in market clearing applies to every trading round. Okay, so now that we've identified uh, two assumptions, implicit in the centralized market assumption, let's take a look at the second one. Okay, the first one has been explored in order to quite extensively. How does the part of assets clear independently matter? Okay, so we'll look at behavior first and then welfare. All right. Um, since we would want to compare centralized and decentralized markets to join clearing with independent clearing, um, let's recall that um, um, equilibrium in a centralized market with large traders can be characterized uh, with two simple conditions. The first one is uh, a trader's FOC. We can draw the expectation and write it pointwise as equalization of uh, the marginal utility with a marginal payment, which would equal price in a competitive model, but now it depends on price impact, lambda i. So this is the first sort of a condition of a monopolist, but it applies to all traders. All traders are largely, this is a multilateral double model, if you will. Notice that if I knew my price impact, I could derive my best response schedule. Um, given that I know my marginal utility, uh, but these price impacts are endogenous. They depend on how others bid. So we want the second equilibrium condition to require that the price impact assumed by the traders uh, must be correct. What does it mean? It must match the slope, the decoven of the actual residual inverse supply defined by aggregation of the amount submitted by others. That's what the second condition is saying. Uh, two remarks. These two conditions, optimization given price impact, and the requirement that price impact should be correct, given an equivalent representation of base and Nash equilibria in the MC demand and supply functions. Working with price impacts directly is going to be much more tractable, you'll see in a moment. And second, the equilibrium condition for price impacts uh, defines a fixed point among traders' price impacts. When trading is centralized, the fixed point can be solved in closed form reveal a property which indicates why centralized markets are so special. Here's a solution at the bottom of the slide. It tells us that the price impact derives essentially from the uh, uh, riskiness of the assets. Um, so um, there is a particular link between uh, price impact and covariance between incentives and risk. With that, let's now consider an independent market clearing for the same traders and assets. Okay, so the market still operates as a uniform price double option, but now the market key equation applies asset by asset rather than to all assets simultaneously. And the objective functions are the same, the information sets are the same, what changes is the choice variable. Now treat as some demands that are contingent only on the price of a given asset. 
Let me focus on what's important here, keeping in mind that what we are after is welfare. Independent market clearing, the more realistic design, introduces inference errors. There is imperfect inference in markets. So recall that when schedules are fully contingent, I can express my demand for asset K as a function of the actual trade of other assets to be realized. The price vector is one-to-one -one with a quantity vector. With uncontingent demands, I can no longer condition my demands this way to a bit in expectation of these trades. Consequently, um, since the inference is imperfect, this changes the ability of my counterparties to absorb my demands. The price impact now depends on private information rather than the fundamental risk alone. So some independence in market clearing, market fragmentation in this sense, transforms the link between price impact and the covariance between incentives and risk. Let me also make a point about the literature now. I had mentioned that um, a lot is happening in terms of modeling of uh, markets with large players right now. Still, um, even advances such as incorporating trader heterogeneity, allowing for rich information structures or flexible market structures, in particular decentralized market structures, have occurred only in the past decade. Um, nevertheless, these advances have now led to a common analytic framework for static, dynamic, centralized, and decentralized markets, which one can further expand by incorporating additional details of market design or market structure. So, in hindsight, which results have enabled this unified approach to static, dynamic, centralized, and decentralized markets? Possibly very different market structures, which might comprise multiple exchanges for different traders and assets each characterized by different details of market design. Well, it was a sequence of results showing that in each of these market structures, equilibrium is equivalent to a fixed point in traders' price impacts. We could already see that equivalence in the centralized market model, but there, it hasn't been used. It allows for a more elegant formulation of the fixed point and an attractive interpretational behavior but it is in models of fragmented markets and dynamic models with private information where it, the equivalence has some bite. In fact, quite a significant bite. So let's um, see here. Since inference is imperfect, um, there is an additional fixed point in traders' expectations across assets which interacts with a fixed point in price impacts across traders. This is a problem of a much greater dimensionality and much greater complexity. Nevertheless, one can show that it's possible uh, to endogenize all of the demand coefficients, including conditional inference um, uh, in terms of traders' price impacts. Okay, so not only does, it reduce, does the, the equivalence reduce the dimensionality of the problem and uh, the computational burden, but it also eliminates the need to analyze traders' uh, beliefs separately. Once we have the prior, the profile of endogenous uh, sufficient statistics suffices. The equivalence also means that market design analysis becomes a choice among traders' price impact profiles we use. Back to the main question. Um, how does the final asset scheme independently remain during the matter? Well, in several recent projects, joined with wonderful co authors, Abby Hyun, who's at UCL, Chen Lu, who graduated from UW last year, and Xia Wu, who will be on the market next year, um, we show that um, market fragmentation, in this sense, motivates innovation in um, financial products and market clearing technology, which will be neutral if well defined at all, if trading were centralized. Okay, so what are these uh, financial products? Think of synthetic products whose payoffs uh, are defined in terms of the payoffs of the traded assets, ETFs, ETPs, or proper derivatives. For market clearing technology, there are many possibilities to motivate some of them. Um, electronic trading platforms increasingly let traders express their preferences, uh, condition their demands, on uh, prices of other assets, much like in the contingent model, but locally on a subset. Right? So these two types of innovations in financial product and uh, market clearing technology 
uh, define uh, different market design problems. They change the game differently. With financial products, uh, the joint distribution of asset changes, the demands are still uncontingent. With innovation in market cleaning technology, there are no new products, just the underlying assets. But now some of them can keep jointly. Both of these types of innovation would be neutral if trading were centralized and demands were fully contingent. So the substantive result here is that um, when assets do not clear jointly, uh, spawning doesn't hold. So the term spawning has now become part of the financial jargon, but the usual linear algebraic intuition applies. So what does spawning mean? Essentially, it means that um, letting traders trade new products whose payoffs lie in the linear span of the traded assets is neutral. It does not change the equilibrium utilities. Assets matter for equilibrium only through their span, but not the asset structure. Um, but markets for synthetic products are among the most active ones. And similarly, there is a lot of interest in the industry right now in designing multi-asset trading algorithms. Uh, traditionally, assets have cleared uh, independently. And so if we take some clues from market practice, um, other than for tax-related purposes, investors choose new products or new technologies either to improve information to hedge events they couldn't hedge before, or to improve our uh, liquidity to lower the price impact. Now, at the same time, regulators often classify derivatives markets as particularly challenging, in part because of the difficulty in um, assessing their impact or the scope for innovating them. Once again, in the standard model, derivatives are redundant. So accordingly, we, accordingly, we teach derivative pricing using one of the following two methods which are the basis for derivative valuation. Um, one assumes the existence of a replicating portfolio. There's, it assumes that we can price new products to be introduced in markets uh, through linear combinations of the prices of the assets that are already traded. That is, it assumes that such products are redundant. The other method allows a market with an exogenity given demand for a derivative product. But if we want to understand which products uh, will and which should be introduced in markets as a function of market characteristics, as a function of the usual premise we assume when we lay down market models, we would need an equilibrium model of non redundant derivatives. And so once we um, account for the fact that it is not the case that all assets can join the international markets, the otherwise standard framework becomes such a model. Uh, financial products are generally non redundant precisely because they affect the trader's ability to condition on events. And they affect their pricing. Um, so one can show that if we start uh, with a market with K assets which all clear independently, all innovations are neutral if and only if the joint distributions of asset payoffs are independent, in which case inference doesn't matter or perfectly correlated, in which case uh, the inference is perfect. For all other joint primitive distributions, innovation will not be neutral. It will affect traders' inference and price impact. Now, um, a counter theory to the audience might say, independent market clearing, these um, contingent schedules, introduce a, a form of contractual incompleteness. Right? So the fact that these products are not neutral is not terribly surprising. And that's an accurate statement. But the point here is that dispensing with the assumption that assets clear jointly in an otherwise standard model, and only this assumption renders financial innovation on, uh, redundant under general conditions without introducing regulatory frictions or uh, uh, trading uh, frictions, which are the usual ways to induce non redundancy in market models. The point here is that. Dispensing with the assumption that all assets key jointly makes design matter. And furthermore, um, the fact that uh, independent market clearing um, savers the length between the asset span and equilibrium payoffs has other consequences. Spanning is the foundation for asset creation, the way we teach it and the way we apply it. I'll mention one of them, but we can now ask. Um, what are the welfare effects of decentralized market design and these new products 
and it allows. Well, to be sure, uh, decentralized market design and these new products may or may not be conducive to uh, efficiency. Using the equilibrium model, one can now give conditions on the primitives under which it will. But let me focus on the more subtle punchline here, which also underscores that exploring decentralized market design is worthwhile and accounting for price impact is critical. So it turns out that one can show that in markets with any traders and assets, it's always possible uh, to design financial products with which a market appears these products independently, these products and the online assets independently, is at least as efficient as a market that appears the existing assets jointly in which these products will be neutral. So there are two results here. First, we can always implement and use the centralized market outcome with simpler schedules, with purely and contingent schedules. So this also implies that the centralized market uh, outcome gives a lower bound on what's possible in welfare terms. Uh, and second, with suitable, suitable design, we can do strictly better. So not only is centralized market design, not only are the fully contingent schedules unnecessary, but they can be strictly set up on. Right, so why? Um, why can a market with multiple trading values appear independently be at least as efficient as the centralized market that clears all assets jointly? And why wouldn't providers let traders condition their demands on prices from other venues? Don't we still can reduce, in fact, eliminate the inference error? If the market were competitive, the fully contingent design, the textbook design, would indeed be the most efficient. Any changes to market clearing would only introduce inference errors. Uh, but when traders are large, changes to market clearing also transform their price impact. And these changes to liquidity can countervail uh, welfare losses due to private information. All right. Um, these were just uh, some examples of innovations that become possible with decentralized trading. Uh, but let me now return to the point why a decentralized mar market design has uh, created a demand for new methods. Well, to begin, it weakens the role of spanning and theorems that rely on it. And the spanning methods have also been used in counterfactual policy analysis uh, because they provided us with an approach to characterize payoff relevant uncertainty in any given model through the implied state space over which the contingent prices were defined. It's so when we evaluate the effects of uh, changes to market design or market structure, we only need to look at the effects of these implied prices. And when spanning is called, uh, for instance, in markets that do not clear all assets jointly, these methods are no longer useful. It, it, it is um, unlikely we will be able to develop some decentralized market counterparts of the spanning methods. And the reason is that when traders are large, uh, the implied representation of the payoff relevant risk, uh, aggregate or idiosyncratic, um, depends on traders' price impact. It depends on how they produce their demands and supplies in response to price impact, which is an equilibrium object. So this representation of the payoff relevant risk can no longer be invariant to uh, the counterfactual uh, changes to market design or market structure. All right, so what can we do? Well, we can always rely on structural analysis for markets with multi unit demands. The relevant techniques were introduced by Ali Hotaxo and Jakub Kassel. These methods are now being extended to fragmented markets. We can do a little bit more. So it turns out that the approach to transforming equilibrium as a fixed point in price impact allows us to introduce new techniques. How? Well, in any market structures we might be comparing, which might offer different products, equilibrium is equivalent to a fixed point in price impacts. But these price impacts uh, live on different assets, and they may have different dimensionality. So they themselves will not be useful in counterfactual or comparative analysis of design. The key analytic tool here involves projections of price impacts from matrix representations of the corresponding fixed point um, onto the price impact for the key underlying assets, intuitively the per unit price impact. That's what matters in utility trends, no matter the market structure, market design, or financial products. 
So um, the centralized market design has also uh, limited the scope for recursive analysis, standard recursive analysis in dynamic models of markets. So this is the second domain that I would like to discuss. Um, when we study decentralized markets, we must, by definition, relax some symmetry assumptions okay, on the market structure, um, who interacts with whom, information structure, who has access to what type of data, or traders' objectives. Um, however, the presence of large heterogeneous players challenges the applicability of the standard recursive methods, um, which rely on Markovian strategies. And the reasons can be gleaned from the theory of dynamic oligopoly, which is the relevant model here. In a T-period market with heterogeneous players, at prices assigned heterogeneous weights to traders behavior signals, which change over time. Consequently, prices become endogenous in the Marconia. The entire history matters and cannot generally be summarized by the last one's outcome. Uh, the entire future price path matters and cannot generally be summarized by the next threat outcome. Okay, so this leads to the problem of forecasting the forecast of others for the players and the curse of the dimensionality for the analyst. Now, these uh, challenges have long been understood and they're the reason why uh, uh, dynamic models of markets, financial markets, or marginally oligopolistic markets can focus on environments that are uh, symmetric in some sense. Okay, so what do we do when we study dynamic markets with large players? Well, we either assume that uh, private information is Markovian and traders are symmetric, it's perhaps the most common assumption in empirical work, uh, or uh, we assume that prices are fully revealing to traders in uh, own lives. <coughs> which requires uh, not only the symmetry of the player's objectives, but also the primitive information structure for the result to hold that prices reveal all the information to traders. Or we assume that private information is disclosed to all traders after each round. Or we work with infant horizon models and study stationary group, yet another joint symmetry assumption. With each of these assumptions, Inference effects are essentially static. Trading decisions can be dynamic, but inference effects are payoff relevant within a round. Um, other authors have focused on um, models where inference, inference effects are relevant in the long run, but trading or production decisions um, are static. An alternative approach, popular in computational work, has relaxed the assumptions on the state variables that players need to keep track of. Okay, so this has led to the notion of the oblivious equilibrium and variants of self-confirming equilibrium. Um, so for instance, in the oblivious equilibrium, traders optimize with respect to the long run uh, distribution or sometimes the first round distribution depending on what questions are of interest. These distributions don't get outdated. The focus is on dynamic trading. Right, so we can see that there is room for uh, developing models and techniques, possibly non-recursive ones. And it would allow equilibrium analysis uh, with dynamic trading and dynamic inference and uh, could accommodate the relevant heterogeneity uh, to study market design questions. All right, so what is challenging with persistent uh, effects in trading and uh, inference? Well, considering how uh, large traders impact the residual market is crucial. Okay? So this is the basic logic underlying um, the first order condition. Um, when changes to quality and inference are payoff relevant for all traders in the long run, my demand change at T affects not only the current round price, but also all future prices, because it affects other traders' quality and inference decisions in the long run. With dynamic trading alone, we can characterize that impact backwards recursively. With dynamic inference alone, we can characterize that impact forward recursively by updating the posteriors. In fact, the literature has shown that with dynamic trading or inference alone, <coughs> even though prices are non Markovian, one can find a state variable that is Markovian, which drastically simplifies the recursive analysis. Once again, we only need to pay attention to the last round or the next round. 
But when both dynamic inference and dynamic training are present, there is a backward and a full recursion that cannot be simplified to a single recursion. Moreover, the problem of forecasting the forecasts of others and the curse of dimensionality came in. Okay? So when I evaluate the impact of my demand change, I need to keep track of all of my heterogeneous counterparties, uh, adjustments in their quantities and posteriors in all future rounds. Moreover, the sequences of these adjustments evolve as time goes by. Okay? So we can also see that imperfect um, competition is key here. So let's consider two extreme market structures, perfectly competitive as the number of traders grows large and monopolistic with a single strategic trader will still allow um, the inference and quantity decisions of strategic traders to be uh, persistent. Well, in a competitive market, my uh, a demand change at T has no effect on prices in the current round or future rounds. So we can still, still use recursive analysis even when private information is persistent. In a monopolistic market, my demand change at T does impact the current round price, but my residual market is not strategic, it doesn't update. Or sometimes we work with monopolistic models with a random arrival of traders, which breaks the dynamic link. Okay, so this also shows what applications are at stake here. Any problems were multiple, uh, large traders interact, making decisions about the future while also learning about the future. Any problem where data collection and production or trading decisions are relevant, pay off relevant in the long run. Now, it turns out that the approach to transform equilibrium into a fixed point in price impact um, can also be helpful here. Instead of keeping track of all of my heterogeneous counterparties, quality and inference adjustments in all of the future runs, we only need to evaluate their payoff relevant impact for me. That is, just as we can define a trader's price impact within a round, in the current round, and define a trader's intertemporal price impact, equivalent is equivalent to a fixed point in these price impact profiles. Because of the equivalence, we no longer need to keep track of uh, the posterior distributions separately. Once we have the prior, the profile of sufficient statistics, the price impact suffices. Okay, so the problem is simpler for the player. The forecasting, the forecasts of others issue is eliminated. It is simpler for the analysts as well. Even though the characterization is now non-recursive, there's a backward and the forward recursion underlying the characterization of these price impact profiles, the curse of the dimensionality is mitigated. Um, now, these techniques work for uh, games in demand supply schedules, also Kuro models and other models of imperfect competition. The same kind of problems uh, are common in various models of dynamic oligopoly. Uh, moreover, the non-recursive representation of, of behavior maps into how uh, firms engage in forecasting. This intertemporal price impact corresponds to how firms engage in forecasting. All right, and for many market design uh, questions, it is useful to keep, to take the market structure as given. But for some problems, uh, for instance, in much empirical work, it is essential to account for the endogeneity of the market structure. So this is going to be the third domain I'd like to discuss. Um, at a high level, the problem of endogenizing the market structure uh, defines a much theoretic problem uh, to which a solution has remained open uh, for two reasons. Okay, so for the first one, um, much in theory going back to uh, Galen Shapley in the 1960s, accommodates well environments, markets or games, in which contracts, agreements among the players or um, relationships in which they engage are substitutable. <coughs> so roughly speaking, this means that signing a contract or entering a relationship makes um, others, makes agents less willing to sign others. We can do more in the sense of allowing for complementarities in large markets. We can do more um, by restricting uh, the class of market structures these relationships can form, for instance, acyclic ones. Uh, we can do more in markets around substitutes. We can do more by considering environments, 
there are isomorphic to subsidies. So this idea has been powerful at least since uh, the Gross Subsidies and Complements Commission uh, 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 was proposed. The most general variant of this isomorphism is full subsidiary. But until quite recently, uh, the so-called maximal domain results in this literature have been interpreted as saying that general complementaries are incompatible with stability. A typical argument goes as follows. If some agents view relationships as substitutable, but others as complementary, we can find substitutable preferences for the former group of agents such that no stable outcome exists. But in a recent paper with Nathan Yoder, who was at the Terry Business School, we show that if all agents view uh, relationships as complementary, the tools of matching theory carry over. This is a new condition. So we now understand these two somewhat extreme environments. All agents view relationships as substitutable or complementary. These two conditions induce a monotonicity of the fixed point operator. These are different operators, uh, which is not guaranteed otherwise. However, pro providing general predictive results about endogenous market structures based on stability requires a theory of stability that can accommodate complementary agreements alongside uh, substitutable ones. Okay? Providing a solution to this problem would also open the door for matching models to new markets. The second reason why um, the problem of endogenous in the market structure has remained open is that accommodating externalities has been challenging. Even uh, in models with uh, substitutability, so even in the classical uh, matching theory. Now, the interest in accommodating externalities is, is perhaps the highest it's ever been, largely large thanks to the new data sets that are becoming available for various markets. Uh, markets for healthcare providers, international trade, uh, financial markets with intermediaries, and so on. So the interest in um, quantifying these externalities and understanding how they shape contract design uh, has led to the popularity of the methods uh, based on Nash and Nash. Um, the problem of accommodating um, externalities uh, has been open in the sense that there isn't a result that guarantees the existence of uh, uh, stable outcomes in their presence. Now, in the second paper with Nathan, we take a step towards providing uh, uh, predictions in matching models with externalities. And it turns out that the approach we propose also resolves the first problem. No restrictions on complementarities and sensibilities are necessary. No restrictions on the market structure or the market size are necessarily there. So in hindsight, the difficulties caused by the presence of externalities and the presence of complementary agreements alongside substitutable ones have been related. Let's explain the basic idea in the familiar example, the roommate problem of Ray and Chocolate. We friends must come to an agreement about which two of them will rent an apartment together. Each agent prefers having some roommate to being unmatched. Um, and the key feature of this example is that the agent's preferences form a cycle. So one would prefer to room with two, who would prefer to room with three, who in turn prefers to room with one. The standard conclusion is that no pair of friends will agree to sign a contract. Each contract will be blocked by someone. No uh, stable con contract exists, no stable outcome exists. And so our starting point is a simple observation. The non-existence of a stable outcome in the roommate problem and more generally comes from an implicit assumption about how agent choices are determined, how they are derived from preferences. Mainly in this example, um, when agents choose between their available contracts, let's say when agent one chooses between his available contracts, he chooses his favorite one. And so agents behave as if they were assuming that any contract they might choose will go into effect. But for a contract to go into effect, it must also be chosen by another agent. Okay? In other words, 
when making their choices. Agents do not take into account the choices of others. They make implicit. They implicitly make incorrect assumptions about others' choices. But what if we require that agents make correct assumptions about others' choices? What if we endow agents with beliefs and require that their beliefs must be correct? Um, we show that single outcomes always exist. So let's see how it might be. Uh, this logic goes in the, in, in the familiar example. If agent one believes that three will choose to roam with him, but agent two, agent two will reject the, their contract, as was the case in the roommate example, um, then agent three, if agent three correctly believes that one will choose to roam with him, he will agree to the contract as his favorite contract. If agent two correctly believes that no friend will choose to roam with him, uh, they will optimally choose to sign down contract, uh, which also justifies the belief of agent one. Okay. At a high level, we show that one can still work for the standard notion of stability uh, once we endogenize agents' choices. This ensures that their choices meet. One might wonder, uh, to the extent that we are interested in working with markets with bilateral relationships, right? so actually we can accommodate multilateral contexts, but if we are interested um, in markets with bilateral relationships, why not use pairwise stability or uh, Nash and Nash? Right? Pairwise stability and Nash and Nash have been applied in environments with externalities and complex preferences featuring susceptibilities and complementarities. Well, pairwise stability and Nash and Nash are able to make predictions under more general conditions than those known to ensure the existence of stable outcomes in matching, um, because they require robustness to fewer deviations. Unlike pairwise stability, matching theoretic stability also allows agents to swap contracts, okay, which is relevant with subsidies or externalities. It also allows agents to add multiple contracts, which is relevant with complementarities or externalities. So our existence result uh, ensures that stable outcomes, uh, and our, our result that ensures the existence of stable outcomes uh, that are robust to uh, the full sort of set of deviations in matching theoretic stability. If I have a couple of minutes, I will just see more. So, in perfect competition, two minutes, okay. <laughs> in perfect competition, um, has shifted our focus from uh, efficiency, right? How do we uh, design markets to induce uh, to ensure the efficient allocation, uh, to thinking about uh, how um, the surplus among the agents is redistributed through market design. The need for market design to embrace values other than revenue and efficiency has been uh, recognized in non-financial markets. These ideas have resonated quite loudly during the pandemic. But in a financial market, um, any type of regulation for market structure, market design, or transparency also involves a decision about a redistribution of risk, which agents will be exposed to which types of shocks, how the risk is going to be shared among market no, it is a simple observation. At the same time, uh, studies of redistributive effects of decentralized market design would really complete our understanding of how market design matters. Um, these questions also provide another opportunity for market design in practice. In perfect competition with all the inefficiencies it induces, motivates the use of market design tools for redistributive, redistributive purposes. So these are some of the relevant surveys that uh, uh, were recently written. Those of you who are interested. Um, I was going to talk about privacy, but I, I was asked to leave some uh, time for questions. So if any of you has a pressing question about privacy, I would be able to answer. Thank you. This is an exciting time for anybody who is interested in thinking about markets. That was a punch.